Hey everybody, welcome to Tech Talk Live. Um, I'm Kristen Gastaldo. I am Alfresco's Community Manager. Uh, today we're joined by Maurizio Salatino from the Activity Team and Ole Helskov, who is going to introduce himself with his new title in just a moment. I'll let you guys go ahead and say hello. Either one of you here wants to say hello first. Sorry, I had, uh, I had a awful echo, so sorry about that. Hi, my name is Ola Heilsko. I am developer evangelist at Alfresco, and I'm super excited to, to be here today and hear more about things. So um, yeah, that's uh, that's me. Yeah, good stuff. My name is Mauricio Salatino. I'm also known as Salavo in the community, and I'm the tech lead of uh, the Activity Cloud project. So I will be talking a little bit about the technology stack that we're using there. And yeah, I hope that you guys enjoy it. Thanks, guys. So if you do have questions during the presentation, uh, Maurizio is happy to take questions as we go along. So you can post them either in the Discord app um, or the IRC channel. Those two can communicate. Or, or we're also taking questions on the YouTube page. So you can put them right in the chat channel. Um, and we'll just jump in as people ask questions. Um, we do have a couple of announcements before we get going. So tomorrow, we're going to host office hours. For those of you who are unfamiliar with office hours, we changed the format a few weeks ago, I guess a few months ago now, actually. Um, we meet every other week on Zoom. Um, you don't have to register. You just show up from a link in the community. Um, it is actually let me pull it up so I can tell you that link. Um, there's a, a document in the community called the New Office Hours. If you just search for that, you can find it, or I'll post it in the announcements as well, and it's on Twitter. Um, it's just alfresco.zoom.us slash my slash office hours. Um, just show up. This is just a conversation. We don't have any presentations. We don't have any slides. It's just a chance for you to come and talk to Alfresco leadership and the folks that build and work on the products and then other community members as well. We do have special guests depending on the um, depending on the date. So tomorrow we'll be joined uh, by Ray Gauss, uh, Greg Milan, and Stefan Koff, who will be talking about um, deployment with Alfresco 6. We do take questions in advance. So if you just want to check the, uh, the document in the community, you can find links to that or on Twitter. So you can take questions, and we'll start with those tomorrow. Um, we don't have any meetups planned right now, oddly enough. So if anybody's interested to host a meetup, reach out to Ole or myself, and we can help support and get that going. Um, Ole, do you want to give us a quick update on DevCon submissions? Yeah, absolutely. So we've had a record year in terms of submissions for DEF CON, which is uh, absolutely great. Uh, we're in the progress of reviewing and sorting them out and, and everything. So I expect that work to complete within the next couple of weeks. And then we uh, we need to finalize the agenda and set it all up and everything. So we expect that if you have submitted something, you will know within the next couple of weeks whether or not it's been accepted. Um, and um, I expect, expect in the First week of November, um, roughly early November, we'll have the agenda finalized and published. So that's super exciting. Um, so yeah, we'll stay tuned and you'll hear more about that. Yep, setting up the agenda itself is the trickiest part. So we'll start announcing. Once people confirm that they're available to come and speak from their selected papers, I'll start putting those on the website so you have an idea of the topics before we even get them organized in a, in a fashion that makes sense. Um, so we do have a, a good amount to cover today. So Maurizio, I'm going to hand it over to you. and. Uh, here we go. If you guys have questions, please ask away. Yep. Sounds good. Let me share my screen then. I do apologize for the templates of uh, these uh, presentations. I used this uh, last week in Geekon Prague. Let me know if you can see my screen, guys. Uh, we do see it. Perfect. And I need to view it. Uh, and I need to uh, present this like slideshow, I guess. Yeah, so the, the the title of the presentation that was announced is Spring Cloud on Kubernetes. And uh, yeah, this is going automatically for some reason, but anyways. So the title of the presentation was Spring Cloud on Kubernetes. This is the presentation about that specifically. And it's basically the lessons learned uh, that we you know, have been uh, learning in our activity cloud project. Uh, as I mentioned before, I'm the activity cloud tech lead, and I'm the one driving this new initiative about Activity Cloud. And Activity Cloud is not more than uh, a set of cloud-native business automation uh, blocks that you can use in order to uh, automate uh, you know, your businesses and accelerate uh, your business processes. Uh, this, uh, this project, in general, is being built on top of Spring Cloud. 
using Docker and targeting Kubernetes as the main deployment platform. So this presentation is all about this journey that we have been going with the activity team uh, towards using this technology stack and also all the challenges that we have been facing while we were trying to do that. Uh, we recognize that there is a wider community building, uh, you know, microservice architectures and trying to deploy things to Kubernetes. And we also recognize that when you're trying to go cloud native, uh, you will face a lot of challenges. And because of that reason, uh, we, we thought that it's a good idea as an activity, as the activity team, as an open source project, to share all the things that we have learned also for other people uh, that is using the same technology stack, also to feel more comfortable with the things that we are building. So if you are used already to this technology stack, uh, our building blocks will feel natural, right? It, for your developers, you will be able to pick up these services and start using it, using them right away. If you are not comfortable with this technology stack, you are in the right place because I will be talking about you know the main challenges that you will face when you to use these technologies. Uh, it's an interesting journey. We have been working on this for the last 60 weeks, uh, and uh, we are about to release uh, the beta 2 version for this project. And we are way much more confident with all this technology now than when we started. So I will be trying to share as much as I can about these topics today. Uh, so as, as Kristen mentioned, uh, I'm more than happy to take questions at any time. And if my connection starts breaking up, just let me know and I will repeat whatever uh, you know you, you missed. Uh, but I'm happy to take questions because uh, there might be a lot of questions about these topics and I'm more than happy to stop at any time and then you know uh, try to answer as many questions as I can. Uh, when we look at activity, we see complicated uh, and a lot of different services, right? So we have a bunch of services that we are deploying and we are, we are building these tools. And these tools usually come into this shape. We uh, consider that there is an infrastructure, usually including a gateway. A gateway is a software component that allows you to route requests to different services. And that gateway is going to interact with, for example, some identity management and single sign-on component that it will enable uh, to provide security to, across all the services behind the gateway. Also, we, are, we have this concept of activity cloud application. And activity cloud application is not just one service, it's a bunch of services. And as you can see here, there are some native uh, Kubernetes services that we are going to consume as part of you know, the, the entire infrastructure. When we talk about an activity cloud application, as I mentioned before, it's a set of containers, a set of services that they interact uh, between each other in order to provide some certain business capabilities. Right? And the common example is if you want to create a process that does some system-to-system -system interactions and also perform some human tasks, uh, these uh, components will deal with all these interactions uh, in, an, in a scalable way, right? So you will usually tend to have these kind of blocks, right? So the runtime bundles, which are basically the ones that are executing our business processes, our connectors that will deal with service-to-service -service interactions, and then some auxiliary services that are optional depending on what kind of you know scenario are you trying to implement, but you will see them at some level and query for getting information out of all the things that are being executed and audit to see the audit trail of all the things that the process engines are, are running. Remember that the activity cloud applications are designed for scalability. So when you start using this kind of infrastructure and this kind of architecture with these architectural patterns, it's because you really want to scale, right? When you think about uh, you know global banks or global organizations, is the kind of requirement that they will that they will impose for the infrastructure, they will want to scale different applications in different ways uh, to support tons of requests or to make sure that they provide a high availability on top of different availability zones, for example, in different continents and stuff. This is kind of like the, the design approach that we have taken. On this. And this, of course, now that you see this, this diagram, as you can see each of these blocks, is going to be a container in, in one way or another. Uh, so when you start dealing with containers, then you need to you realize that the complexity of dealing with multiple containers becomes larger and larger the more containers that you have. So you need a methodology and a practice, and you need to be very pragmatic on how you do that in order to be able to deal with this level of complexity. As part of the Activity Cloud team, we are uh, promoting a set of technologies and trying to work with these other frameworks to make sure that your life is not more complicated but uh, easier. When we talk about cloud-native architectures, there are some other projects that are following the same lines. 
So this is not something that we have embedded in Activity Cloud. It's not a new architecture, or we are not doing anything crazy in there. We're just you know, following the same approach that some other communities are following. When we talk about cloud native architectures, you will see these kind of graphs, these kind of architectural charts, where there, there are you know, common components that are repeated every time. Right? This is the jhipster project, and this is the jhipster default architecture for microservices. And here you can clearly see that there are some repetitions, right? So we have a gateway, we have a security and identity management mechanism, we have some monitoring as well. We have that in, in Activity Cloud as well. And there, there are some infrastructural services like a service registry or a configuration server, right? So, and then of course, all the microservices that in our case are Activity Cloud applications that are just not, not a single microservice, but a bunch of microservices uh, uh, collaborate and, uh, collaborating in order to perform a business uh, scenario. Uh, so you will see this architecture coming back again and again and again. And if you take a look at other people doing cloud native architectures, you will see something very, very similar. So we're just making sure that if you're working with this approach, working with Activity Cloud will feel completely natural and you can just plug in our services and things should work. Uh, so we have been going through this uh, journey. Uh, it, it, as I mentioned at the beginning, it's a year-long journey of finding out how this technology is being used and taking from different communities best practices. This band uh, from the 70s, an American band from the 70s, and if you look into Wikipedia, it's how this journey basically feels. It's quoted as one of the most beloved and one of the most hated bands from the 70s. And to be honest, we you know we have learned a lot, but it has been quite a painful journey in order to get stuff working in a, in a, in a fast way. Also, a disclaimer, it's important for people to understand that when we talk about cloud native architectures and microservices in general, uh, you definitely, it's highly recommended to start with this approach of monolith first, right? When we started Activity Cloud, we didn't start it from the scratch without knowing what the end result is. We started knowing a well-defined monolith with a bunch of features, right? So we took, you know, 40, 50% of the features that the monolith had into and then we start breaking those apart, making sure that we can deliver that first and then build more features on top of that baseline set. So we started with Spring Boot, of course. We started with Spring Boot 2 a, a year ago uh, with the earliest mile shots, uh, uh, mile, uh, milestones of Spring, uh, of Spring Boot 2. And uh, we did that mostly because we are an open source project and we wanted to make sure that whenever we release a final GA version of Activity Cloud, it's tested on top of a very well tested Spring Boot application. So we have been collaborating with the Spring Boot community in order to make sure Spring Boot 2 is up to the standards. Also, we start playing up very early with Docker, uh, following this common pattern, right? So that's why we have the 12factor.net website there. So 12factor was defined by Heroku almost seven years ago. And Basically, they define a set of uh, things that each of your services should be ad adhered to in order to work in a distributed system. And basically, Spring Boot gives you all the tools to build these services. And as soon as you follow you know, the common Spring Boot approach of generating you know, this fat jar that can be deployed, you are kind of OK. Right? So when you are coming from a big monolith, transforming that monolith into a Spring Boot app, it will take you, you know, further, but it will not be a cloud native application. So what we have done is we have, you know, break down into smaller services our architecture, and we have created these Spring Boot uh, services that will allow you to deploy that into Kubernetes at the end of the day. Each of these Spring Boot applications will be packaged as a Docker image, and when we start this journey, the main issue that we faced is that our services, for example, the process engine, the process runtime, requires a database in order to work, right, in order to store data about the executions of the processes. So what we basically did is we created a Docker Compose file that basically allows us to create the environment quite quickly, right? So we configure a PostgreSQL database in a Docker Compose file. So every developer working on a service using the process runtime can just quickly bootstrap that, uh, that, you know, that database without installing a local database or having a centralized database that every developer will, will work with. When you are working with distributed teams, that's extremely important, and when you are when you want to make sure that you can make progress on that thing without updating or upgrading a database installation, that's extremely important. And the more you go distributed, you depend on databases, you depend on, for example, the gateway or single sign-on as well. So you need to make sure that you have a fast way of bootstrapping these environments. 
we also, from the very early, uh, you know, uh, moments of the project, we recognize that there is a common practice among people building cloud native applications or following this approach of having one service, one repository. And that brings a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of advantages. Uh, but of course, it increases the complexity on how many repositories do you have in your project, right? So if you take a look now at the activity organization, we have 38 active repositories that we are working on. And those repositories are being used to create our core building block services. And it also contains some examples and some acceptance tests that are testing these services. So the complexity grows on managing these repositories, but the contents of each repository is well focused and well scoped. So each, each repository can be released independently, each repository you know, can be tested independently, and you keep you know, a very tight focus on that repository. So you can have even one team working on that single repository without you know, bothering any of, of the other team. Uh, for us, this was a great change compared to Activity 6. Activity 6 was a big repository with tons of main modules. And it didn't allow us to you know, naturally evolve each of the features contained in that repository independently. So now we feel way much more comfortable on the maturity of each piece. And we can control and release each piece separately. And that definitely helped us to reduce the release cycles. When you're working in a service, of course, at the end of the day, you will end up with the Docker file for each service to, in order to create a Docker image for it. And of course, that also adds another extra layer of complexity. In general, you will need to deal uh, with building that Docker image and also releasing and labeling and tagging these Docker images. Right? As a software developer, as a Java engineer, the last thing that I want to do is uh, I want to worry where I'm going to store these Docker images. Right? So that's something that you will need to do if you are targeting Kubernetes. Sooner or later, you will need to have a Docker registry. You will need to have all the you know, configuration of that Docker registry somewhere so you can quickly release new Docker images and new versions every time that you make a change into that service. Uh, we started using Docker Hub, uh, which is good. But uh, we can use that because we are an open source project. So we can use the public repositories straight away. But if you're working on a private uh, you know, project, you will need to definitely uh, pay for the private repositories or set up your own Docker registry. Again, that's usually not something that a uh, Java developer is really interested. But if you are starting in this journey, you will need to convince your company that you need one of these and that needs to be set up and that takes time. And when you step back a little bit from a single service responsibility or from one single service, you step back and look at the entire architecture, then you realize that you need to start thinking about cloud native patterns. When you're building these distributed systems, there are well documented patterns that you can follow in order to not make mistakes, basically. I totally recommend these three books that tackle different angles on how you build these you know, distributed system and cloud native applications. So first of all, you have the building microservices from Sam Newman. Uh, Newman. Uh, this is extremely recommended because they, uh, Sam describes patterns on how you build these systems. And it describes some high level techniques on how you architect these systems and how different pieces will interact between each other. The middle one, Cloud Native Java from Josh Long and Kenny Bastani. It's a very important book if you're coming from the Spring community because it covers the Spring Boot, the advantages of using Spring Boot, and also a Spring Cloud, right? That adds another layer of, uh, of Cloud Native patterns to be applied on top of Spring Boot applications. And it finished the book with a, a chapter on pipelines, which is a really important topic, and also Cloud Foundry, right? So the missing piece of this book is usually Kubernetes, right? So if you're targeting Kubernetes, this book is not covering Kubernetes. But all the concepts and all the frameworks that are described through the book are extremely important and extremely related with the things that I will be showing today in this presentation. And lastly, domain, implementing domain-driven designs. Uh, this is very also a very important theoretical book on how to implement DDD, which is a methodology to, again, design software and also to make sure that the design of your software go to go along with the, you know, the problem that you're trying to solve in an organization. So extremely recommended books for you guys. Uh, for me, they, these are kind of like must read if you are implementing something like this. And then uh, the next step, of course, is Spring Cloud. Uh, this is just more technical. Now, as a Spring Boot developer or as a Java developer, when you go to the Spring Cloud website, you will see a bunch of different components and things. And in reality, you can go and pick them separately. But if you are serious about building cloud native applications at the end of the day, you probably need them all, right? Like they are designed in a cohesive way. So they are designed 
in a way that they make sense uh, if you are building like a very robust and resilient cloud native application. It's good because you can, of course, you can start experimenting with one, for example, the gateway, and then pick up streams or contracts or whatever in, in, in whatever order you want. But at the end of the day, most of these things make sense if you use them together, right? So I totally recommend to start checking this out if you are not familiar with Spring Cloud. In general, as a Java developer going to different Java conferences, uh, in general, people know one of these things. For example, Eureka and Spring Cloud Discovery is one of the most well-known uh, Spring Cloud components, and people feel comfortable with that. But you know, when you start adding more and more Spring Cloud components into the mix, then people tend to get confused. So I totally recommend you to check that and also to check Cloud Native Java book because the relationship between these components is ex very good uh, explained there. I can hear a microphone, so if somebody has a question about this, please feel free to ask it. Um, we did have a question come in on the YouTube channel. Um, There's a question about why Activity uh, uses the Open JDK Slim as base, but Alfresco uses Oracle JDK. Do you have any insight as to why we're um, yeah, we're going you know with two different options there? Uh, not really. So <laughs> there is there is no specific answer to that question, and mostly. Uh, in, in Activity Cloud, Activity Cloud is an open source project, and the, deliver, the deliverables from that uh, project are just jars and you know Spring Boot starters. Uh, the Docker images that we are creating are just plain uh, examples. They are not part of you know our deliverables and our released artifacts. It's just examples of services consuming the frameworks that we are building. So we are not planning to productize any of those images. Uh, and the product, like in our case, APS, which is building on top of Activity Cloud, they will probably use the same, uh, you know, base image as, as Alfresco. So hopefully that answered the question. Okay. There is, okay. Um, there is a follow-up question. Um, sure. Let me pull it up here. Uh, it says, some, sorry, something equivalent material for Activity Docker images. And then, in fact, there are, Okay. Okay. And Anhil said you got his question. Perfect. Great. Awesome. Uh, so, of course, that when you start dealing with Docker images, then Docker Compose will become the next step, the next logical step of, of, for people. And we, as, as an Activity Cloud team, we start playing with Docker Compose quite heavily at the beginning, mostly because, again, we were creating some services, some example services, and we wanted to put them all together. So, on top of our infrastructure, Docker Compose file that started, you know, databases, message brokers, gateways. We created another Docker Compose file for Activity Cloud applications, right? Just to bootstrap all the Activity Cloud applications. But we became really discouraged to continue using that, mostly because, again, our target was Kubernetes. Docker Compose gives you some solutions for quickly booting up stuff, but the things that you boot up with Docker Compose behave completely different uh, as the thing that you boot up with inside Kubernetes. So when we did the initial proof of concept, we had a couple of Docker Compose files. We bootstrap all the services there. But as soon as we moved from POC to start planning what we are going to release now in beta 1 and beta 2, we said, OK, let's focus on Kubernetes. And that you know, introduces another layer of, of complexity. So when we start looking into Kubernetes, the main problem, which is not the problem, is you, know, it's, you need to learn about how Kubernetes works and the main concepts that the Kubernetes you know, as a platform provides. right? So what is the service, what's the deployment, what a replica set is, what a config map and secrets are, what cron jobs and, and jobs are. right? In order to start playing with Kubernetes concepts, I will not cover what these concepts are, but in general, this will give you um, the mechanisms to you know, put your service inside Kubernetes so Kubernetes can handle the state and replicate that if needed and restart services if needed and resize the cluster if needed. right? Uh, when, in order to start playing with these concepts, uh, we went through this little guy here, which is Minikube, which is basically an installation of um, a Kubernetes cluster with a single node in your local machine using a virtual machine. And again, for playing with concepts and doing small deployments, that's, that's OK. But we also quickly realized that that's not going to move us forward in testing things in the same way that our customers will test things in real Kubernetes clusters. So, even if we went through that phase, and I totally recommend to check it out, there are several projects like Minikube that allows you to have quick uh, a Kubernetes cluster. I will totally recommend to push your developers to start real-life clusters, which also introduces the next complexity, which is 
asking for a Kubernetes cluster inside your company, right? So how do you create clusters? How do you manage clusters? And make, making sure that developers can have access to the clusters that they need in order to test the software. For us, that means that we are testing our services in real life clusters as our customers will do. So if we know that it works in our clusters, in our you know, clusters hosted on, on Amazon or on Google or in any other cloud provider, our customers will have the same experience. And when we start that road of, of testing Spring Cloud in Kubernetes, we realized that Spring Cloud was designed before Kubernetes was popular and around, meaning that there, there are some impedance mismatch between these frameworks and technologies, right? Kubernetes comes from a very polyglot environment, right? Well, Java is the same as any other language like Python or Ruby or anything else. Uh, so we started noticing that some of the instruction layers in Spring Cloud didn't match one one with what Kubernetes was expecting. Right? For that reason, uh, and you know, you start realizing that you know, for example, when we were looking before at the JHipster chart, you know, if you go to Kubernetes, there are some there is some overlap between base core services that were provided by Spring Boot that when you're running in Kubernetes, you don't you don't really need those anymore. For example, service registry and a configuration server, which are components that were provided by Spring Cloud before, when you're running in Kubernetes, you don't need them anymore because Kubernetes provide their own native services to do these kind of functionalities. So the only thing that we needed from the Spring Cloud perspective is the programming model and knowing that we will need a service registry and a configuration server. And they provide very, very well-designed interfaces to abstract those things. Right? Uh, another thing that we realize is that even if we are working with Kubernetes, right, the last thing that you want to do in, in a production environment is to deploy your own database and manage your own database with your message brokers. If you are working in a cloud provider like Amazon, uh, you expect the cloud provider to give you, you know, or provision you a new database instance that you can go and store data to, right? So for now, when we are deploying Activity Cloud, right, so we can configure how to deploy a new database, but in reality, when you deploy in a cloud provider, you will want to bind to that database or that resource. And that's a very important difference, and that's something that we are working at quite actively in the Activity Cloud community. Luckily for us, we found out this project that is called Spring Cloud Kubernetes, and we are quite active in this project, mostly because we are depending on, 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 this, you know, in, on these frameworks and these implementations of the Spring Cloud uh, interfaces uh, to be used inside Kubernetes, right? So when we are creating Activity Cloud, when we know that we want to discover a service, we should use you know, the Spring Cloud interfaces, but with different implementations when we are running inside Kubernetes. Uh, this project was in, in, the in, in the Spring Cloud incubation process. And because we started contributing to it, this project has now moved into you know, the main Spring Cloud repository. And it's part of the new Spring Cloud release frame. We are quite happy because we are making this project better for everyone. And we are also getting all the experience from that community as well built into Activity Cloud. That's very interesting. I totally recommend one of the key takeaways that I, you know, I want you guys, if you are looking into Kubernetes, take a look at this project that it's getting better and better. And of course, uh, if you are looking into Kubernetes, sooner or later you will realize that it's basically a YAML hell. The, if you want to deploy things into Kubernetes, you will need to create YAML files. And those YAML files will describe how your services are going to be deployed inside Kubernetes. Uh, and we, doing along our journey, we found out that, of course, the Kubernetes community is very vibrant. And there are tons of tools created in order to automate the creation of these YAML files. And there are tons of conventions that you can follow to minimize the work that you need to do on this side. We are trying to follow as part of the Activity Cloud community many conventions we can to reduce the amount of work that we need to do in order to deploy our services to Kubernetes. After working with YAML files, then you will figure out that you, know, you have Kubernetes Helm uh, that allows you to package these descriptors into a chart, something that they define as a Helm chart. And you package all the things and version all the things in a simple way. So you don't deal with separate descriptors for doing different deployments. You just can build these hierarchical charts, charts that uh, you can deploy, and you know they can deploy a bunch of services, uh, sending uh, with you know default parameters or with custom parameters depending if you are deploying to staging, production, or you know QA. Right? The idea is you have the same deployment, you just change the parameters, and then you deploy in different environments, and you can upgrade each of these uh, deployments easily.
So we are heavily relying now on Helm charts for, for Activity Cloud to provide these you know, example sets that you can quickly bootstrap everything with just one single command line into a real Kubernetes cluster. And of course, then, if you are looking into the Kubernetes space, then it's about choose your destiny, right? So you can go for plain vanilla Kubernetes. And in general, as Activity Cloud, we are relying on that and on Kubernetes, plain vanilla Kubernetes as our abstraction. If we can deploy to Kubernetes, that means that we can go to any of the cloud providers and deploy our software in there, right? And then the next stage is to make sure that we understand what each cloud provider you know, especially provides, right? Like integration with specific services from each cloud provider that can make our software better and better integrated to, to you know, these different offerings. We are currently targeting EKS as our you know, main deployment platform, and we will add more and more integration to it the more that we move along, along the way. And of course, uh, we realized a little bit late. I mean, we knew from the very beginning that CI CD will become extremely important sooner or later. Uh, you can imagine that if you have 38 repositories and you have you know, a small team to deal with all those things, you will need to automate as much as you can. So uh, we started four months ago, four or five months ago, to heavily invest in our CI CD practices. And we are currently quite happy to. Uh, to you know, bring as part of beta two our internal pipelines and our internal knowledge of how to build all these services and how to build all these example layers and how to deploy all these things in a very simple way, simple and natural way that allows us to go fast, right? You can imagine that if you have 38 repositories and you want to do a release, releasing all the things, tagging all the repositories and deploying, for example, to Maven Central, our Java artifacts, might be a little bit complicated. So now we are quite happy to say that well, even if that's complicated, at least we know how to do it and we're extremely fast. We have been uh, looking into this project that it's called Jenkins X, and I'm kind of quite happy with how these things are going. Uh, this project basically is a summary or, or like is helping you with all these things that I mentioned before, right? So to have a pipeline to move from a service that you can create, like let's say that it's an activity cloud application or one of the services inside the activity cloud application, you can define a pipeline on how to promote that, how to move that from source code to a Docker image, to a Kubernetes, you know, the script set and to a Helm chart and to deploy that into an environment, right? So for a normal Spring Boot developer, how do you take a Spring Boot application and how do you transform that Spring Boot application into something that can run inside Kubernetes? Not only that, but also manage that and release that in a CI CD approach. Jenkins X also provides a Git, a Git op approach, meaning that you will have every environment like a staging or production backed up by a Git repository. And that Git repository will contain all the configuration for that environment, right? So even if your cluster goes down, you have all the configuration in Git, meaning that you can create a new cluster to point to that configuration and you will have your environments up and running. It also means that when you are changing your environment, for example, promoting a new service into that environment, that will mean that you will create a pull request into that repository, and there will be a pipeline that will be in charge of merging that pull request and to apply that change into that environment, which is kind of like cool. And if everything is automated, you probably don't need to do anything, just adhere to the conventions and the standards that are, they are taking from the Kubernetes community. So I will not go to these details on how you get it started with Jenkins X, but it's basically just installing a CLI and then just installing Jenkins X into your Kubernetes cluster and then just you know, importing your Spring Boot applications. Uh, I, would like to, yeah, I would like to stop here and see if people have questions. I know that I went through tons of different topics. Uh, and you will see that this is all applied uh, in Activity Cloud, in the Activity Cloud project. And I wanted to share until this point with you guys to see how if people is already using some of these tools, if people there is using Kubernetes, and what are their experiences around these topics? So I will pause a little bit. Yeah, we so don't just, have any. Uh, oh, go ahead. I'll let you yeah, just, uh, there's not really many questions uh, come up. Uh, there was sure. some conversation um, follow up on the the Open JDK and stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. there's some, uh, Ray made a comment that um, with the latest uh, Docker desktop uh, release, we actually have a 
a real Kubernetes cluster uh, embedded there, so you can use that directly on your desktop. So you don't have to rely on um, on a cloud environment to um, to use Kubernetes, and you don't have to uh, set up Minikube, which I know can be uh, quite cumbersome to to deal with. Um, but uh, yeah, I think um, I don't think there's any questions at this stage. That's good. Yeah, that sounds good. You can use uh, Kubernetes or Docker desktop. Uh, Deployments, that's good. Of course, you will be tied to uh, memory, right? And memory on your laptop and resources on your laptop if you want to do a big deployment. But yeah, you can definitely start playing with that. Uh, not something that we are doing for the Activity Cloud team. We are just definitely working completely remote, like everything in the, in the, in the cloud. So uh, I had a demo. Uh, again, this is quite a complicated demo. I, I wanted to demonstrate that we can quickly deploy a Spring Boot application into a Kubernetes cluster using Jenkins X and explain a little bit more about the Spring Cloud Kubernetes, which is kind of like a cornerstone that we are using on top of Activity Cloud, because again, we want to make sure that our services are aware that they are running inside the Kubernetes cluster and they can consume services in there without explicitly tying us up to the Kubernetes APIs. So the demo, uh, the scenario that I had is a concert, so a concert ticket site. Basically, you can imagine that you have to a website to buy uh, tickets for a concert. So there is a concert service that basically is hosting all the concerts, all the events that are being listed in there. And then you will have a ticket service per concert, basically. So if you want to sell tickets, there will be a dedicated instance of that ticket service to deal with that specific concert. And we will be using you know, service discovery and config maps in order to configure these things and in order to be able to link things together, right? The idea is that this guy here, the concert, ser concert service, can you know, use the ticket service if it's available, can discover the ticket services that are available, and then decorate uh, the information about the concert if needed, right? So basically, if the ticket service is not there, well, we are not going to be able to decorate the concert in information, but if the ticket service is there, we should be able to call the ticket service, get the, um, the available tickets for that concert, and then decorate the concert information. We are going to go through a gateway, meaning that we will have a gateway component in there, and every request that we make against the services are going to go through the gateway, and then they can just generate new requests into other services. I was planning also to show you a little bit of the code and how we do that, and what are the dependencies that we are including in our Spring applications. But we can take it any way you guys want. So if somebody has a question, feel free, feel free to interrupt me while I try to run this, this demo. Tons of things can go wrong in this demo. Uh, there is a quite a complicated scenario in general. Like there, is, there are tons of things happening, and we can troubleshoot those things together. But at some point, if I have, I have been having some problems with my current cluster and my current setup, uh, if things should work. If they doesn't, we will see what's going on there. So let me switch the screen. Uh, so the first thing that I will do, just to get started with this, is I will go to my browser. Uh, and I don't know how many of you guys know this, this, uh, this page. This is Spring Initializer. Here you can create a Spring Boot application, basically. Right? And I wanted to show that I will create a new Spring Boot application almost anything, right? So I've added four dependencies, the web dependency for the web stack, uh, security, because I need to make sure that I enable some request to some endpoints. Then I have something that is called Spring Boot Admin Client. This allows me to monitor the application when I deploy it. And I also have the actuator endpoints, right? Because I just want to, again, I want, I want to monitor these applications and I want to know when they are up or if they are healthy or not. So I will just generate the project here and this is going to create a zip file. Uh, that it's going to be here. So this is, again, it's just a, the most simple application that we can create. And it's called Ticket Service Just Band. This is trying to uh, create a service for this, uh, you know, for this concert in general, right? So we can, before, yeah, so let me open that application while it opens in IntelliJ. Open this. Uh, I have it here. So that's the project that I just uh, created. This is going to import the Maven project. Yep, there it is. And this basically has nothing. So it has the dependencies that I've added there in the Spring Initializer website. It also has some plugins about the Spring Boot. And I need to add here some, some extra 
configurations for the execution. And the only thing that I'm adding here is just to make sure that when I build this uh, Spring Boot application, I add some extra information again to be able to monitor this, this application. If we open this file, this is the Spring Boot application. And again, here, the only thing that I need to do is need to add some security configuration for enabling some requests to some of the endpoints. Again, just to monitor the application. Importing all the dependencies, and then I will create a REST controller here. Very simple application. So it's a GET request, and the endpoint is tickets. Uh, and this returns available tickets for that specific concept. In this case, it's a just one. So let's say that we have 1,000 tickets for that one, right? So very simple application. It only has one endpoint. And it's going to provide that number, right? If you want to move forward this, this example, basically you will need to provide a mechanism to sell these tickets and you know to decrement this number every time that you sell a ticket. One more thing that I need to do before moving forward is to again add more properties here for exposing the health endpoints and the operators. And that's basically configuration, right? So not, not any any more changes are needed in order to deploy this. What I can do now. I can go to the terminal and I'm inside the directory where this application is, right? So I have it here, this is the application. And I can build it just to make sure. I don't really need to build it locally, but I wanted to build it in order to see that at least you know the basic endpoint is, is correct and the Spring Boot uh, context is starting correctly, right? So this seems to be working. The test is okay, so the context is okay. The next step is to basically import this in Jenkins X. And basically, this is going to create a bunch of things for us. Remember that I mentioned. Um, uh, Mauricio, can yeah. you uh, can you increase the font size, the font size. In, the, uh, in the terminal? Yep. And Thanks. you see that now? Yes, I think it's better now. Yep. Okay. So first of all, Jenkins X provide different environments. So I need to make sure that I'm on the development environment in order to import an application. And I will import this, and I will show you guys what this is doing, right? Remember that the only thing that I did is I downloaded a zip file that contains the Spring Boot application. But because Jenkins X works looking into code that it's stored in Git and it's going to build my project remotely, it needs to have access to that source code. So the first thing that it's going to suggest me to do is to create a repository for this, uh, for this application. Because it asked me about my user and I provide my user the credentials before, it's going to create a repository for me in GitHub in this case. And it's going to push all the code in there. So let's wait for that. It's asking me where, which organization, the name of the repository. Let's see if everything goes OK. I ran this test before, so there might be some, some clashing in the repository name. So let's see, the application was created, the repository was created. I can go to, to, uh, to Jenkins X. This is the old Jenkins UI as well. And we should be able to see, if I can load incorrectly, that there is a new pipeline now. And there is a new pipeline trying to build my project. I will stop it a little bit while I show you what that uh, Im import process uh, created. And we can see that now we have new things in here. First of all, we have a pipeline that defines by convention the steps that I need in order to deploy, basically release, create all these artifacts, release them, and then deploy this service into the Kubernetes cluster. So the pipeline contains all the steps, and it will automatically perform those steps every time that I change something in this repository. It also created a Docker file by default. And again, that's probably where our base image is coming from. And it also created all these descriptors that I mentioned based on conventions, right? So we have here a folder that basically created a deployment descriptor to make sure that we can deploy these. And it defines how many replicas do we want for our service and all these things. And we will see a ton of you know, parameters here. These are Helm parameters that you can override in this values jump file. And then a service descriptor, which is the same. It's like, OK, which, you know, what's the name of our service and how Kubernetes will allow us to access to this service. The only change that I will make here in this descriptor before moving forward is I'm going to add some extra labels uh, so I can bind and I can, you know, again, find the service from different places. So basically what I'm saying is that this service now is a Spring Boot application. Remember that Kubernetes doesn't know anything about Spring Boot. It is also having some other labels to recognize, OK, this is a ticket service, so it's providing the tickets functionality. So when I want to discover this service, 
I can use that label in order to filter all the other services that I have running in my environment. And I will use a code to do that service discovery from the concept service. So this code is going to be used in order to, in order to uh, bind the services at, at runtime. Right? Uh, so there are several techni techniques to do this. I'm just choosing this one because it's the easiest way of doing it. And then the last thing that I will change is the, you know, the memory and CPU allowance for, for this uh, application inside Kubernetes. So the cluster gives the application more resources. I'm just changing that quickly. Let's not worry that much about that. So again, if I go back to my terminal, let's go here. I did some changes. I will commit these changes. Tables and CPU, right? So I will push this. And again, because I'm pushing uh, this, these changes, and because we Jenkins X automatically created some Git hooks to my source code repository. We can go here and we can refresh and the pipeline will be triggered again, okay? So this pipeline is going to execute all these steps that I mentioned before. It's going to build our Maven project. It's going to release our Maven project to a Nexus instance. It's going to create the Docker image based on the Docker file that it was automatically created. It's going to publish that Docker image into a Docker registry. And then it's going to create a Helm chart and release that Helm chart into a Helm chart repository. And finally, with that Helm chart, it's going to push uh, a change into the staging environment in order to deploy that new version of that service. While all those things happen, which because it usually takes time, it usually takes six to seven minutes if everything goes okay. Uh, I would love to show you a little bit more about the code not for you know the code for the application that I already wrote is quite simple because it's just a standalone service that it's going to be you know uh, uh, requested from the concept service. But I wanted to show the code a little bit more in detail of the gateway, right, and the dependencies that we are using here. So the gateway is is doing a couple of interesting things. So for example, if we go to the terminal, we can go and do a request to the gateway, and in this case we are requesting the routes that are registered in there remember that the gateway is front facing a bunch of services in this case the ticket services and the concept services so i can do a request on that gateway and i should be able to get all the registered routes that i have in here right so i already have a ticket service deployed i already have the concept service deployed and i already have yeah the gateway itself so i only have two routes and uh this gateway is basically looking into the services that are deployed into the Kubernetes namespace where this gateway is running and automatically registering uh, new routes, new paths for the different services. So you can access through the gateway. You probably need this kind of uh, component in order to make sure that your front end or your UIs have a single entry point for interacting with all the services. And this uh, gateway is using a, you know, the discovery client, basically. It's using the discovery client, and that's why we are adding this dependency here, which basically enables the gateway to use the discovery client from Spring Cloud to figure out which other services are around. So automatically, the gateway has that built-in functionality of saying, OK, which services do I can see? If I see all the services, and if a new service gets registered, I will automatically register a new route for it so other people can access from outside. Uh, and it, it is also using the config dependency, which basically allows us to uh, configure this specific application based on, on, you know, the environment, right? In Kubernetes, you have config maps, so we can bring configuration from the Kubernetes native way of creating configurations and consuming configurations. And Spring Boot will understand that the configurations and all the properties needs to come from, from there and not from, for example, the application properties. It also adds uh, a possibility to uh, monitor changes, right? So if the configuration changes, this dependency will keep monitoring the, the, the configuration. And if the configuration changes, it, it will automatically refresh uh, you know, the bins and the scope and you know, the application without killing it and restarting it again. If you take a look at the source code of this um, gateway, it's extremely simple. So we have a dependency to Spring Cloud Gateway, which is this one, which is adding all the logic about what the gateway is. And then nothing else besides enabling the discovery client for this application. Just saying, OK, there is a mechanism to discover other services. Please just use that mechanism based on the class path dependencies. In this case, it's the Kubernetes discovery client. 
So it will use the Kubernetes services in order to figure out which services are deployed and to register automatically the routes. A, a more advanced scenario of service discovery, it's implemented in the other, in the concept service, as I mentioned before. Uh, so if we go here, concept, if we open this one, uh, yeah, in this case, it's more like a, how you know you do service discovery when you have um, you know a business logic to implement, right? In this case, it's not an automatic discovery. We don't want to discover services because uh, you know we want to just register every service, but we want to do some filtering and we want to figure out on runtime which services are available to interact. And this is the case that I was mentioning before. We have a concert. And there might be a ticket service for that concert, but if there is no ticket service for that concert, you know, this, this service still needs to return information. If there is that service, that extra service will decorate that information and it will return the decorated information. So as you can see, we are using the Spring Cloud uh, Discovery Client. And again, this is a common interface. This is not tied to Eureka. It's not tied to Kubernetes. It's a common interface. So the programming model, it's the same. It doesn't matter what's the implementation for that service. And if you take a look at where we're we using this, this is basically it's been here. And you said basically, give me all the services that are registered in the context. In this case, it's Kubernetes. It's asking the Kubernetes service registry which services are available. And based on the service, we are implementing some matching, right? And the matching, the filtering on criteria on this is the code that I created and I added into a label, right? So if there is a service matching to that description, it's going to create a request to that service, which is the next thing that we are doing here. We are using the web client in order to go to interact with that ticket service, do a request on top of the tickets URL. That's the, the endpoint that I implemented before. And if we had a re response for that, we will just return the concept with the available tickets for, for that specific uh, concept. So all that those things are happening there. We are also using the config maps as well as I mentioned before to implement something like a you know like a, a feature flag where you can enable and disable different features on top of a service without the need of restarting the service itself. It's not recommended this. This is just an example on how you can use this, but uh, but uh, it is important for you to understand like a simple example. We're using Spring configurations and, conf and configuration properties here in order to define how to read this configuration. Again, there is nothing Kubernetes related in this mechanism. It's just a Spring Boot mechanism. The only thing that we are doing in this application is, again, adding the Spring Cloud Kubernetes config module that will fetch this configuration from the Kubernetes services. So you can keep using the Spring Boot model of configurations and how to read this data. And inside your applications, you don't really need to know where that information is coming from. So if you take a look here, we have a method that, again, it says, OK, there is a Boolean flag there that says, do we need to decorate every concert when we are listing all the concerts, or we just need to decorate the concert when the, you know, the user goes into the concert details? Basically, that's basically what we are enabling. Just for you to see a little bit of the endpoints, we can do a request to those endpoints. I can go back here. And we can definitely get the available concepts, right? As I mentioned before, we have a couple of concepts created, right? So we have two concepts. We have added driving here. And as you can see, the available tickets for that concerts are non-available. That means that, again, when we are listing, where we are requesting the list of concerts, the, serve, the, the, the tickets are not automatically uh, decorated. But if I query that service in particular, you will see that the available tickets are returned there. Uh, and that's the default way of working, right? So we have a configuration, a way to say, no, when I ask the, the list of, of concerts, please decorate all the, service, all, the, all the concerts that you can, right? So let's check up the pipeline. Let's see if everything worked as expected. So it seems that the pipeline worked. Uh, there, there is a way now. So what I will be doing is I will be switching to the staging environment where my service is running now. Also, so I can see if my service is up or not. So I can see that the service is pending here. There, as I mentioned before, I have been having some issues with my cluster today. It's about resources. And I can quickly demonstrate that it's about resources if I describe this pod. Uh, describe, describe pod. Yeah, so you can clearly see insufficient CPUs. I'm using my cluster. And I recognize that there is an issue with the builder. 
thing that is building our Docker images and our Maven projects. So I will kill some of those things and uh, and dev, which are running here in the dev environment. So uh, usually you should do this, right? But this is going to basically delete some some pods that are consuming tons of resources that they shouldn't, uh, and that might be a bug that you know was recently discovered or something. So I've already reported it should be fixed too. Uh, so as soon as you know Kubernetes killed those pods, my service in the other namespace should be able to start. Something that I didn't show you before is that Jenkins X get uh, some of these things installed by default, like Nexus, right? So I have Nexus installed, I have a Docker registry installed. I have Jenkins, which is running the pipelines, and I have Chart Museum, which is the one storing my Helm charts. You can, of course, go to the UI and, and check all those things, right? So because I, I run this pipeline uh, to uh, deploy my service, that meant that I released my jar artifacts. So we can go to Alfresco here. And that's my service. That's version 0 0.0.1. And we can also check this monitoring tool that it's called the Spring Boot Admin tool. Uh, that we adapted it as well to use the Spring Cloud Kubernetes dependencies to locate services, right? So you can see here which services are running in that namespace. And we are filtering, and you can do monitoring. That's why I added that dependency at the beginning, right? Ah, not that one. So if you go here, you can clearly monitor the application, see how much memory it's using, and also, yeah, you can just take a look at the, you know, at the threads that are running and see if everything is okay. So this is kind of like a cool feature, and again, because this application was built based on Spring Boot, the only things that we did is just make sure that this uh, application, when deployed on Kubernetes, can find out Kubernetes services. And you can clearly see here that because I killed the other pods, the new service is up and running with version 0 0.0.1. And the last thing that we can do is we can create a concert that points to that ticket service to see if the, you know, the concert gets decorated when we call that, uh, that concert information. So again, we go back, we were requesting the concerts, right? We had two concerts. Now we have the just one concert. So we can check it out here. Uh, let me see if I have a just band. I do not have a just band. So let me move this one to just band JSON. Uh, and then I can do this uh, just band JSON. Right. The name is not important to be honest, but let's go, let's be clear. Just band, uh, and just, and let's say that this is a DevCon. It would be really nice to have a just band of DevCon this year. So organizer takes notes. Uh, so I have that now. That means that I can post, you know, that JSON and create a new concert. Just band. So I created that just one concert. Now, uh, if we go again here, oh god, it's too big. Yeah. So if I go back again and get the concert, now I have that concert created. Probably it's taking some time. So I have that concert created. As you can see, again, it's not decorated. If I ask for this, it should get decorated. Now we have a thousand tickets. That's the initial uh, project that and the initial value that I created into this project. And then the last thing that I can show, guys, because I think that we might be over time already, is that yeah, I, I was going to warn you, we're coming up on the hour. Yeah, yeah, perfect. So let me show one more thing, which is basically enabling the decoration using a config map to the entire list. So I have two ticket service, one for this one, one for this one. So these two guys should be decorated. If I toggle on that uh, configuration for the de automatic decoration of the entire list, so I can do kubectl. First of all, and uh, yeah, get bots. Let me see where we are. So, paging, just to switch to this environment, I can see my services, right? So, I have all the services that are up and running. Uh, and I do, I can see the config maps as well, which is all these configuration properties that we can use. And I can go here and change this config map live in runtime. In order to enable that decoration flag, you can see here that the config map basically hosts an application property. This can be changed as well, configured in, in different ways. But just to demonstrate that, I will set this to true. And without restarting any pod or restarting any application, I should be able to query the concepts again. Right. 
and now my services that are available are decorating the, cons the concept list. Right? This can be implemented in different ways, but again, this is just to demonstrate you know, how this can be done easily in the Spring Boot way, in the Spring Cloud way, uh, without changing much on your programming model or changing the code that your developers are already working and they feel familiar with. So that's my presentation. Uh, I just want to share one last slide, which is this one, about all, all the things that the Activity Cloud team is looking into. We consider these things like Knative, Istio, and the Kubernetes Service Catalog as key things, key pieces for you know a cloud native infrastructure. So we are looking into these uh, technologies, and those might come later on, right? So we are evaluating, doing some spikes, understanding how this technology works. They are quite new. They are above Kubernetes, right? So Kubernetes for us is the first milestone, but there are tons of new things created in the Kubernetes communities uh, that we should keep an eye on, and we are. So if you're interested in this technology, or if you want to share, or if you want to learn about these things, please get in touch with the Activity Cloud team, and let's collaborate, and let's uh, make sure that we share what we learn uh, with each other. So that's pretty much it. I appreciate that, your time, and you can contact me in any of these links and get in touch. Awesome. Thank you, Maurizio. Um, we are good on questions in YouTube. Let me double check in the Discord app. I think we're good there too. Uh, we did have a request if you have these slides living somewhere online. I don't know if you're going to put them in um, SlideShare or something. If you have the slides, we can. if you yep. can send me that link, we'll link to the slides and the presentation. And this will obviously just go up in YouTube so you guys can access it and watch it anytime. Make it full screen so you can see a little better. Um, yeah. Perfect. Uh, cool. Um, and again, if anybody has any questions, you know how to find Ole and myself. We're in the community. Uh, we're in the Discord app. And Maurizio is on the Gitter channel and in the community and on Twitter. You can find him. Everywhere. So. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, guys, for coming. We will talk to you uh, tomorrow at office hours if you're available. Thanks, guys. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye. Thank